Our next speaker is Simon Neverson from Govan Right, and Simon has over 25 years of experience advising boards, partnerships, senior managers about governance. So this then becomes a really interesting story for disruption. Disruption and governance are kind of dissonant together. How do these two things fit? But people have oversight responsibilities and they need to know how to deal with these issues. So we're going to talk, uh, or hear from Simon and later talk a little bit more about governance for disruption. Well, thanks, Ella, and uh, thanks for the opportunity of talking to you. Can you hear me all right down the back there? I often hesitate doing that because I was at a conference one time where someone said that and the bloke about where you are stood up and said, mate, I can hear you. But I'll gladly swap places with someone who can't. So, <laughs> now, following on from Keith's interesting, I'm now going to explain to you the barriers of getting this change through to boards and what we're talking about around boards and the challenge of modern governance. So, I'll start off with um, some of the information that we send to boards about the challenge of not, not changing. There's some research indicates that in 2006, of the top 10 uh, uh, organisations, there are only now three who are in the top 10 uh, 10 years later. And that indicates a need for organisations to change. And around the board table, uh, getting boards to think about change and preempting is a key challenge that we work towards. Some research done by Deloitte's uh, called the Value Killers indicates that about 38%, uh, 40% of organisations in the top top organisations had suffered a fairly significant event. And one of the things that I talk a lot about with directors is that they need to preempt these events as opposed to respond to these events. And many of these events in hindsight were predictable, but the boards, because they thought they could control things, uh, did not uh, prepare and therefore only responded. So I'm going to take you through some of the challenges of governance and then perhaps hopefully give you some threads that in inspiring disruption and inspiring change you may be able to use in your own boardrooms. So why is governance important? I think we live in a world of change. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and change leads to uncertainty. It's uncertainty leads to fear and fear leads to conflict. It's very hard to govern in the environment of conflict. And so what we talk about is governance is about making what is otherwise uncertain certain. But by trying to provide some clarity about what you can't see. Uh, and that involves the concept of emerging governance and the concept of being able to preempt change as opposed to predict change. So why is this important around the board tables and the messages we give? Because the board's role has changed quite significantly over the last 15 years and even very significantly over the last two years. And what I talk about is today's society's expectations is next year's law. And so boards need to be understanding the expectations of them to preempt and prepare for governance in the 2018s, 2020s. So just a little bit of a story of where we come from in governance. Uh, when you look at these areas at around the turn of the century, we had quite a famous case called the HIH case. You might remember that. Uh, where there was some significant erring. And at that time, the directors were able to use a very sophisticated defence that I call the Sergeant Schultz defence. Anybody? Any Sergeant Schultz with us? Thank you. I'm glad we've got an older group. I actually gave this talk to a group of students one time and they didn't actually know who Sergeant Schultz was. So, Sergeant? So the key issue there is that at the time, the law looked at what did the directors know. So it was a defence to some degree to apply a much more master-servant relationship. And basically boards were said to be able to rely on what they were being told. We roll forward about seven to eight years to the second case, which is an important one, uh, called the Centro case. And you'll know the Centro case, you would have heard some of these things. And at this point in time, the board was found to have erred because they did not respond when they presented the accounts, I'm going to go into too much detail, it's presented the accounts in a way that uh, it was the disclosure of uh, a liability. But the key issue for them is, at that time, Justice Middleton introduced the term, what should they know? So as late as 10 years ago, we have the concept of directors being held to account of not what did they know, what they can see, but what should they know? And that was a significant shift. And in fact, the fact that they weren't told was uh, ruled to be inadequate. One of the cases that's in the press at the moment, you may have seen, is the 7-Eleven case. 
Uh, you recall that 7-Eleven directors were found, or the organisation was found, to have erred in some legal and uh, other obligations. And the current governance challenge to this board is, did the board create the culture that led to the illegal act? This is quite an extraordinary test for directors, and a lot of what I call age challenge directors are suffering from the concept of not being able to predict, and therefore, how can I respond? And when I talk about this, I talk about, should a director have visited a 7-Eleven store? Probably, yes. Yeah. Should they know the type of employees? But to some degree, there's an argument that current boardrooms are still looking at what they can control and what they can see, as opposed to, as Keith was saying, what they can vision or dream. And so the key element has moved even in the last little while to the board's obligation about engaging culture. I've never seen it more important to have engagement of your workplace and your ability to govern in 2018. So we need to rely on management. We need to have a relationship with management whereby good and bad information comes up. And gone are the days of being able to say, I didn't know. And gone are the days of being able to uh, ask uh, selective questions to be able to try and protect yourself. The future, I think, is an interesting challenge, and this is a very sad case, but I think it does show where the expectation and challenge of modern governance lies, and that is in the Dreamworld case. Um, we had the terrible incident where uh, there was a couple of people um, killed in the, in the ride, and the key issue there is the challenge as to whether the staff who were operating that ride were sufficiently trained, whether the ride was sufficiently repaired. The key issue here is, how does a board know that what's meant to be happening is happening? And so we've moved through a defence of saying around the board table that if we have a policy in place, it's okay. We're moving now to an expectation that the boards need to inform themselves, positively assure themselves that what's meant to be happening is happening. And that comes down to a real resource deployment. Why is it up to boards to do that? Because they own the beans. They set the culture. They do all this stuff, they are responsible for it. I asked the chair of uh, one of Sydney's uh, private schools recently, I said, how, how do you know someone checked the studs last Saturday? He said, it's not my job, that's management's job. And I said, well, who sets the culture? Oh, we do. Who sets the strategy? Oh, oh we do. Who sets the, the budget? Oh, oh, we do. Who makes sure that we have a, a mindset around safety? Oh, we do. I said, mate, I'm not asking you to check the studs. I'm asking you to put a framework in place to ensure the studs are checked. And this is the big challenge, and I dare say the big opportunity for you guys looking at how do I get these modern thoughts of disruption around the board table, because the expectations of a director has significantly shifted from a master-servant relationship to much more an engaged mindset, and also the need to preempt rather than respond. So we need to have an engaged management and we need to be supported by some understanding and framework that what's meant to be happening is happening. Where does this fit in disruption? As I mentioned, that the boards need to be able to not look for what they can control, but to be able to respond when it occurs. I think this is the massive shift I'm seeing and we're, we're trying to talk around board tables. Why? Because the expectation is you should have known. And so this disruption play is interesting and, and it introduces a third element of governance. Traditionally, people talk about governance being about driving performance, about overseeing risk. I, I introduce a third element of governance called emerging governance, which is basically the governance of change. I'm not really a believer in the unknown unknowns, because an unknown unknown means I don't know what I didn't know because I didn't know I didn't know it. It basically, what I am interested in is the items that could have a large impact on the organisation with low or unknown certainty. And I ask my boards to inform themselves, is there any increase in likelihood? And this is where people who are interested in disruption can get a seat at the table. We need to introduce emerging governance items about the likelihood and where the pressure for disruption is. Because too often boards are governing these items when it occurs. And by then, it's too late. So the key challenge is where we've come from is boards were all over management like this. And this was the historical message. And you had uh, detailed papers bordering on management, a little direction on the risk return. And basically the key element is the management responded to the questions that were asked. But if I'm going to operate in a should mindset with an expectation I should have known as a director, I don't know what the right question is. You see, so I have to set a framework up to ensure myself that these questions are asked and they come to my attention. 
So the challenge we've got of modern governance is to truly get the board to hover over the organisation, to provide this framework that results on um, board papers that provide information around oversight, give positive assurance, focus on the three key elements of a board's role, to grow the organisation, to oversee the management of risk and critically for what we're talking about today, to oversee change. To be ready to respond when the event is becoming more likely as opposed to when it becomes a crisis and we haven't looked at it. One of my challenges of being a governance person is I have this disease where I look at everything from a governance angle. It makes uh, Sunday morning shopping pretty interesting. Um, but I saw Ben-Hur recently and I thought there's got to be a governance analogy in Ben-Hur. <laughs> so there it is in the chariot race. What I say to my board is I want you to think about you as a board on the chariot with a loose hole in the reins. And your stallion or mare in front of you is guiding the organisation. You decide whether you give the mare its, or the stallion its head. You decide through the steering of resources where you want it to go. But you are not propelling the organisation. The stallion or mayor is not. Together you are. So the board's job is to be on the chariot with a loose hole in the reins, looking over the hill, looking for the challenges, looking for the problems. And this is the fundamental shift, I think, where if we introduce disruption, we can get the board's thinking about things that may happen as opposed to things that are happening. So how do we do this? Uh, basically, we do it around governance. Um, we've just been chastised by another consultant about uh, frameworks. Um, but I do think it, it does, it's a simple way of thinking. What I say is the board uh, has four key responsibilities, if you look at any board. They're to oversee the growth of the organisation. Why? Because they control the resources. The board's job is to spend money that they don't own. The shareholders own the money, the members own the money. I spent a lot of time reminding directors this is not your money and I think this is where some of the modern cases are challenging because the people around the table in suits have forgotten this fact. So you steer the resources to bring the organisation to a better position and that's one of your key jobs of growth. The second element which is what we're talking about today is you need to respond to positive and negative trends. You need to think about these emerging items and be ready should the event occur. So for example, some of my clients, we have an emerging item of an Australian dollar at 45 cents. Now this morning it's at 75 and a, 79 and a half. But if I have that on the agenda, I've got someone in the, in the organisation looking at, and when it starts to creep down, they might say, guys, I know we didn't see this, but it's on the way. So we can start doing something around at a board table when it's in the low 70s, as opposed to where it is now, where it comes to 48. And the same thing in disruption. We've got to get an agenda around the board table where you guys are looking towards and people at boards are looking towards either opportunities or challenges of disruption and getting it in board conversation as the likelihood is increasing as opposed to responding to when the event occurs. So the oversight of change. And finally, the, the oversight of the balance uh, of uh, oversight and management around risk. Too many boards just focus on risk. They're too negative in that regard. They're too risk averse. I can assure you, the more risk you take in a controlled environment, the more likely your outcome is. And what we're talking about in emerging governance is taking risk. It's about the unknown. The challenge we saw from the first slide here is that if we don't change and respond, we are not going to keep up. The last element is that the board is responsible for resource deployment. I constantly focus on boards to say, oh, why is this my job? Because you guys own the beans. You guys are in charge of where you spend the money. You guys decide whether you have innovation departments. You guys decide whether you have investment in, in technology and forward thinking. And that's where we have to get the board's understanding that if they don't do it, it's not going to happen. So the solution that we're talking about really uh, is that we need to make sure that we give boards comfort that what's meant to be happening is happening. That doesn't involve going and checking the studs. But it does mean that we want to put a framework in place to bring the board's attention if there's a problem. And I'm passionate about what I call the orange and the reds. If something comes up from the field and people are not adhering to the policy, that's good information. Because guess what? The policy may be hopeless or they don't have resources or they don't have the information or they don't have the leadership or they don't have the culture. That's what the board needs to do. If a board's receiving all green lights, that's when I start to get nervous. Okay, because they're being told what they want to hear. And under a should mindset, that's not going to be a defence. Um, we need to make sure that boards are responding not just to when they receive board papers, 
but when they the issue requires. And the emerging governance item means that if there is more likelihood of an event occurring between board meetings, that's when we have a board meeting around a particular solution. And we have to support, in my case, we do a lot of work in the not-for-profit sector as well as the for-profit sector. Quickest way to disengage a director is to waste their time. Quickest way to get, disengage a manager is to ask a question that's answered on the third page, on the third paragraph of your management report. I was in a meeting yesterday where exactly this issue happened. What we need to do is look at how do we get information up to the board that gives them the comfort along these key items, but also gets them ready to respond to disruption. So this afternoon, we're gonna be talking a bit more detail about that, about how we frame it um, to do the key area and how do we embed governance so that uh, the organisation becomes a disruptor and not a disruptee. Uh, because too many organisations are waiting to be disrupted. Uh, I think there was a saying, you don't get sacked for buying IBM. 22nd of August 2016, census. Do you get sacked for buying IBM? Your entitlement to existence, I think, is going. And those who are not prepared for disruption and governing it from the board and potentially considering the chief, uh, appointment of the chief sci-fi officer and thinking more laterally are going to strangle the opportunity and, in my opinion, will be the disruptee. So that's what we're going to be talking about this afternoon uh, and trying to give some insight as to how we can give you some tips to get things around the board table. That's it for me. How do you give a 15 minute talk in 15 minutes? Mate? Awesome. Thank you, Simon, for making what can be a pretty overwhelming topic very interesting and accessible and I think very practical for us all to think about as well.